pale face by Ellie Forder Condon. The town hadn't changed in the 17 years she'd been away. Suburban houses, local businesses, and more nature than she'd ever seen in the city passed by the windows of her taxi. Erica merely glanced at them before checking her Blackberry once more. 10.02. Two minutes late to meet her new landlady. No new emails. Finally, the taxi slowed to a stop in front of a two-story house, different but somehow the same as all its neighbors. Erica climbed out of the cab with her briefcase in hand and then stepped around to the back of the taxi to grab her suitcase before paying the driver. He got a small tip for taking his time. As she was walking up the sidewalk, the front door opened and an older woman named Leslie stepped out. There you are, Erica. Right on time, said Leslie with a friendly smile. Come on in. Do you need any help with your bags? Erica shook her head. I'm fine, thank you. She walked through the front door and looked around the entryway. Aside from some new furnishings, not even the inside of the house had changed much. She was beginning to feel nostalgic at the sight of it all. It's been so long. How are your parents doing? Oh, I'm sorry, you probably want to settle down first. Here, up these stairs. Leslie gestured to the staircase behind her and waited for Erica to take the lead before guiding her up. What had once been the attic was now a fully refurbished one-room apartment, which Erica would be renting for the next two weeks for her working vacation. Thank you again for letting me stay here, Erica said as she sat her suitcase on the bed and briefcase on top of the desk. You're more than welcome, Leslie replied. Feel free to stay as long as you need. I know there will be some people around who'll be glad to hear you're back in town. If you ever need me, my bedroom is on the ground floor. The doorbell rang. Oh, I'll get that. Let me know if you need anything. With that. She left Erica alone in the room that would be her home for the next few weeks. Erica wandered over to the window overlooking the street. There stood her old home of nine years. Part of her wondered who lived there now. Her parents had been in such a hurry to leave, she never had a chance to meet the new owners. Watching the house now, she noticed someone standing next to it. Perhaps it was the new resident? From what she could tell. He was wearing a full black suit and was bald, with oddly pale skin. Perhaps it was the distance between them, but she couldn't make out any features on his face. Even so, it felt like he was staring at her window. At her. The sight sent a shiver down her spine. Her door opened again. Erica quickly closed the curtains and turned to see who her new visitor was. In walked a man who was her age although he was a full head taller than she was, with teased brown hair and a boyish face that had hardly changed since she'd last seen it. Stephen? Is that you? Erica asked. You're still around here? I never moved, unlike you, Stephen replied, giving her a smile. Wow, you look. Well, you don't look like you just came out of the sandbox anymore. Gee, thanks, Erica chuckled and I don't have to look down at you anymore. That'll take some getting used to. Stephen gave a half laugh and walked over to the window. So, what are you looking at? My old home, she answered, glancing at it once more. She froze momentarily and stared at the house. What happened to the man? Did he go back inside? Stephen didn't notice her pause. So what brings you back into town? Business, she replied. I'm a journalist now. I'm writing an article on the child disappearances from years ago. Interesting choice of topic, considering you're a survivor, he said, poking her arm. You too. Erica returned the poke. Odd, she didn't usually act so childish. Perhaps it was her company. She and Stephen had been best friends when she lived here. Actually, that could work in my favor. Would you be willing to do an interview later? and get my name in the paper? I'll be famous. Sure I will. That was Stephen. Always the cheerful one. Sorry to keep this reunion short, but I do have unpacking to do, and after the long train ride, a nap sounds really good right now. How about we have dinner together later? Erica moved to her suitcase, opened it, and began taking her clothes out. It might have to wait a while. 
I have to work tomorrow, Stephen said. Tomorrow night? I have all weekend off. I'll even make dinner for you and we can catch up while we eat. Dinner prepared by a bachelor? Is that safe? Erica laughed. She retrieved a brown silk nightgown from her suitcase and laid it out on the bed. Hey! Just because I'm single doesn't mean I can't cook. Nice dress, by the way, Stephen said, gesturing to the nightgown. Maybe you should wear that on our date. It's not a date, and this is not a dress. It's my pajamas. I thought you were leaving? I see when I'm not wanted. Seven on Saturday, got it? Erica nodded, and with that, he left the room. She found her eyes wandering from the door to the window, toward her old home. The man still hadn't returned. She probably should have asked Stephen who the new residents were. Her first stop was the police station. The kidnappings had been their biggest case in decades, there had to be files about it in their archives. Erica took a taxi to the station and readied her recorder before walking inside. The secretary at the front desk was on the phone, and paid her no attention as she walked up to him. She listened just long enough to realize he was chatting about last night's football game. Excuse me. Erica cleared her throat to get his attention. I am Erica Everson of the... The secretary held up a hand to silence her and spoke into the phone. Can you hold for a moment? Thank you. He placed the phone down and looked at her. What do you need? I'm writing an article on the child disappearances 17 years ago. That case was closed a long time ago. But you must still have the files on it, right? Can I see them? Fine. The secretary stood and led her to a door with archives written in bold black letters. Once inside, he opened the drawer marked 1994 and flipped through the files until he found what he was looking for. He handed the folder to her and said, You can't leave with it, but I'll let you read it. Erica skimmed the pages and photos. Eight children gone in a month, all between the ages of three and eleven. Some were reported taken from their beds in the middle of the night, while others apparently wandered off when their parents weren't looking. Search parties were in the woods around the town for days, with no sign of the missing children. In the end, the case was closed, with no leads or clues. Every child had their own missing persons report filed, with a picture attached to each one. One picture appeared different from the others, though, it was a full page, unlike the other wallet-sized ones, and depicted the local park. She counted nine children in total, plus one adult under the tree in the center of the park. Her eyes narrowed as she focused on the adult. He looked almost too tall, and he had what seemed like three arms on one side and two arms on the other, protruding out like tentacles and blending in with the shadows. There was a note paper clip to the photo. Photographer, Philip Watson. Reported dead, natural causes, day after photo taken. Last picture of the victims together. Taken two days before the first kidnapping. Erica showed the photo to the secretary and pointed the man out to him. Can you tell me who he is? The secretary looked at the photo and shook his head. Barely looks like a man. The photo's too distorted. It must have been taken on an old camera. Erica nodded silently and handed the file back to the secretary. Thank you for your time. Her high heels clicked on the ground as she walked back to the cab, which was still waiting out front. Take me to Sterling Park, she instructed as she sat in the back seat again. The cab ride was a short ten minutes. Erica looked up from her Blackberry only once, as they paused at a stop sign. On the corner. A tall man in a black business suit turned to look straight at their cab. Just when Erica recognized him as the man she had seen from the window the day before, the cab driver took off again. The man was out of sight and out of mind by the time Erica turned around. Then they reached the park captured in Philip Watson's photo. Erica handed the cab driver his fare, stepped out, and walked toward the park. Crisp fall air bit at her legs making her wish she had worn a longer skirt, or at least thicker hose. Thankfully, it was still early in the afternoon, and school was still in session. She still had an hour or two before kids swarmed the playground.
The playground equipment had a few upgrades, but still retained the same general layout she remembered. She guessed it also still held the reputation as the place to be for anyone under the age of 12. Behind the metal playset stood the tree from the photo, but unlike the photo or other trees around it, which were still changing their colors, this tree stood bare and leafless. On the trunk of the tree, painted in white, was a circle with a large X through it. Was that a new gang symbol? She didn't think the town had a gang problem. Erica found her eyes drawn to the symbol, and she couldn't bring herself to look away for a long moment. When she finally shook herself out of her stupor, she noticed a mound of dirt at the base of the tree which had been disturbed recently. X marks the spot, Erica decided, kneeling down. She used her hand to brush away dirt, and soon enough, found the corner of a manila folder. Further digging uncovered the full folder, holding a small stack of paper. She looked over her shoulder, wondering if this was some prank, but there was no one around to see their success. Erica pulled the folder out of the dirt and opened it. Inside were crude, childish drawings, all in black crayon. Although they appeared to be by different artists, they all depicted similar objects. Every picture had the same symbol from the tree, sometimes multiple times over. Others showed a man in a black suit, but no color had been given to his face, nor were any facial features drawn in. Almost every picture was signed in messy handwriting. Daniel S., Tim F., Ariel, Emily H., Peter, Alexandra, J. Erica's eyes widened. These were the names of her missing classmates. She pulled her phone out of her pocket and snapped pictures of the drawings. They came out too blurry and in low quality, and Erica found that her hands were shaking. She didn't have time to take better pictures. She felt a sense of urgency, telling her she needed to get out of the park immediately. She stuffed the drawings back into the folder and picked it up, tucking the folder under her arm, close to her body. She power walked back to Leslie's house, ignoring the discomfort her heels were giving her. She crossed the four blocks in less than five minutes. She wasted no time going up the two flights of stairs and returning to her room. She placed the folder on the desk and spread the drawings out where she could see each one at the same time. Every missing child was accounted for in these papers. What did it mean? Why had each one drawn the same thing? Did it have something to do with their kidnapper? Erica noticed one last drawing. Her name was scribbled in the lower corner. It showed the same, faceless man as the others, but with his head crossed out with an X. There was a pattern forming. The man wasn't faceless. The symbol was his face. The picture was signed with her name, but Erica had no recollection of drawing it, or of seeing the man before. Her insides felt cold. Erica hurriedly placed the drawings into a pile back in the folder and shoved the folder away from her, across the desk. This was too much information for one day. She had to step back, collect her thoughts. She moved over to the window and looked outside. There he was, the bald new resident. He stood in the front yard now, head tilted back to stare up at her. She still could not make out his face, but she knew. He was staring at her. Erica quickly closed the curtains, her heart racing. What was with that guy? She opened the curtains just enough to peek outside. He was gone. Calm down, Erica. You need to get back to work she told herself. Erica placed her netbook on the desk and sat down as it booted up. Just notes for now. She'd write the actual article later. She opened a new Word document. All the missing children in one photograph, taken only days before the kidnappings. Drawings found of faceless man, signed by all the kids. No evidence ever found, no clear crime scenes. Her notes were making little sense, even to her. Eric rubbed her eyes, which were threatening to close permanently. She needed coffee. As Erica walked down to the kitchen, she passed by a window and glanced outside. The sun was setting. When had that happened? It had just been one o'clock a few hours ago. Wait, what? Erica shook her head. She needed that coffee bad. Leslie had made a fresh pot recently, and there was some left over for her. How thoughtful. 
Erica smiled and took note to thank Leslie later. Erica poured the rest of the coffee into a mug and added a little cream. Warm caffeine, journalist fuel, just what the editor called for. With her coffee in hand, Erica returned to her room. She could write better notes now, maybe even begin the article itself. She opened her netbook again and brought it out of sleep mode. What greeted her was not her Word document, but a white screen with cracks creating a black encircled decks. X. Erica stared hard at the computer. How the hell? When did this happen? That man. She threw open her curtains. Still no sign of him. Now I'm just being paranoid. Erica stepped away from the window. She needed a break. Stephen was waiting in his car to pick her up for their dinner together. It was early evening, and the sun had just set, although it was not fully dark yet. They chatted during the trip as Stephen drove her to the flat that had been his home even when they were kids. You still live with your parents, I see, Erica commented. Hey, give me a break. They moved away to be closer to Grandma, but let me keep the place. They stood on his front porch for a moment while Stephen fished the house key out of his pocket. So, where do you work that they have you looking up unsolved old crimes? The National Enquirer. My paper is a little less fake than that. With Halloween coming up, my editor wants to have a special issue dedicated to the great American mysteries. You know, hauntings, unexplained disappearances, things like that. Erica stepped through the door as Stephen held it open. Something smells good. What's for dinner? Roast beef with gravy, mashed potatoes, and green beans, just like Mom used to make. Stephen grinned proudly as he led her to the dining room table. They passed the doorway to the kitchen, and Erica noted the wrappers for the food in the trash, all with microwave directions. Well, at least he'd tried. Erica took the seat across from him and served herself the food when he told her to eat up. She placed her recorder on the table and pressed the red button before speaking. So, Stephen, do you remember anything weird from around the time of the kidnappings? Any strange men? Were your classmates acting any different than normal? Straight to business, huh? Stephen scooped himself some mashed potatoes and chewed them while he mulled over her question. Not really. I do remember being sick in bed for days around that time after eating a box of chocolate laxative, though. I remember that, Erica laughed. How did your parents handle it? Mom was pretty freaked. Dad convinced her I'd be safe as long as they kept me at home until the kidnapper was caught, though. Not that it mattered, because after so many of their students disappeared, the elementary school closed down for a week or so and told everyone to stay home. But no one was ever found. Yeah, I know. Once the disappearances stopped for a while, everyone was pretty on edge, some even moved away like you did, but then the school opened up, and Dad made me start going to school again, but either he or Mom walked with me everywhere for the next month. Erica nodded and paused the interview to finish eating. She'd just bitten into her last piece of roast beef when Stephen suddenly stood up. Crud. I forgot something. Be right back. Stephen rushed past her into the kitchen and retrieved a small sliced cheesecake from the freezer. He'd forgotten to thaw it. Stupid. Stephen rapped himself on the head with his knuckles. Oh well. Maybe it'd be fine if he stuck it in the microwave for a few minutes. A scream startled his thoughts. Stephen rushed back to the dining room to find Erica fallen out of her seat, staring with wide eyes at the window next to her. He ran and helped her back into her chair. Erica? What the heck happened? You okay? He is out there. Erica pointed out the window to his backyard with a shaky hand. That bastard's been following me ever since I got here. Stephen frowned and looked out the window. No one's out there. He was just Erica turned to the window again and found it empty. I know he was there, Stephen. I saw him. Calm down. Who was out there? I, I don't know his name, Erica admitted, shoulders sagging. Whoever lives across the street from me. Bald, always wearing a black suit, faceless. His brows knit in confusion. Faceless? You're not making any sense. And no one lives across from you. 
the people who owned it after you moved out about a year ago. I don't know what I'm saying either. Erica groaned and put her head in her hands. Maybe I'm not getting enough sleep. The cheesecake could wait. Let's finish this interview another time. Call me tomorrow and we'll plan another date. I'll drive you home. You sound like you really need the rest. Erica nodded with a small sigh. You're right. Thank you, Stephen. Kid's laughter rang out around her. It was a clear, sunny day, warm enough for Erica to be wearing her favorite t-shirt. It was her turn for the slide. She climbed up to the top, turned, and smiled for the flash of a camera. The photographer gave her a thumbs up. Erica laughed and slid to the ground. She heard her mother calling her. Aw, oh, was it time to go already? Erica ignored her and ran instead toward the large tree, where her friends, Emily and Alex, were playing with Barbies in the shade. A man stood with her friends. He was tall, slender, and larger than either of her parents. Erica could only stand in awe of him. His pale, eyeless face stared back. His head tilted to the side, and the man held out his white hand to her. Erica reached out her hand and placed it in his palm. It was light, airy, cold, and she felt her whole body go numb at the touch. She couldn't move. From his arm came a black tentacle which slithered over her hand and around her wrist. Erica's mother called for her again. She turned away from the man and ran, ran as fast and as far away as she could. Her skin felt cold and clammy. Erica panted as she awoke, wide eyes darting around the room of her apartment on the second floor of Leslie's house. She sat up slowly and glanced down at herself. Her brown silk nightgown was drenched in cold sweat. That day at the park, she had seen him. The slender, faceless man had been there, scouting them out, picking his targets. But he had failed. Erica's parents had taken her away. Stephen had been absent that day. Her first instinct was to lunge for her purse and grab her phone. No signal. Erica cursed and climbed out of bed, sprinting for the chest of drawers. She'd get dressed, go outside, find some way to contact Stephen. She looked at herself in the mirror. It wasn't herself in the mirror. It was him. He had found her, the last child from that day. A thin line appeared on his pale, smooth skin, forming lips which unfurled to show jagged teeth. Erica knew Leslie was downstairs. All she would have to do was scream to end this, make some sort of noise loud enough to be heard, but she could make nothing leave her throat. At that moment, Erica knew she was staring death in the faceless mouth. Her feet seemed to work. Erica dashed away from the mirror and ran for the hall. Something wrapped around her ankle, causing her to fall to the floor. The edges of her vision faded to blackness as dark tendrils overwhelmed her. She was aware of her body dragging across the polished wood. Then nothing. Her name's Erica Everson. Last I saw her was when I drove her home about two days ago. A, uh, five foot five, brunette. She's a journalist. I know some things happened to her. Last we spoke, she told me she had a stalker. I dunno, I never saw the guy. She said he was bald, wore a black suit, faceless, I'm being serious. I told you, I never saw him. That's how she described him. Thanks. Stephen ended the call and slammed the phone back down on the charger. Why'd he have to say faceless? Now they probably thought he was some prank caller. He cursed at himself and pulled a Coke out of the fridge. After popping it open, he took a large swig and sighed. He should have gone outside and looked for the stalker when she first pointed him out given the creep a good punch in whatever face he didn't have. If he'd done anything to hurt Erica. A creaking sounded from his front porch. Stephen ignored it until another something creaked again, followed by a third creak, too rhythmic to be an intruding animal. Stephen walked to the front door, flipping the light switch to the porch on as he passed, and stepped outside. The coke slipped from his hand and fell to the floor. Its contents spilled onto the wood creating a fizzing brown puddle next to a dark red pool. There swung a woman, stiff and cold. Blood trailed down her body, beginning just above the noose hugging her neck. 
Whatever facial features she once had were gone now, replaced by fleshless bone. She wore only a brown silk nightgown.